Hello and welcome to Access Chat. This week we're delighted to welcome David Pollard from the Rehab Group. David is part of our community and has been participating in the conversations for quite some time now. David, um, tell us a bit about your journey into accessibility and assistive tech because unlike most of us old farts, you're a relatively young person. So how did you come to be involved and, and what got you excited about accessibility? Thanks for having me, guys. Uh, really appreciate it. We've been following the, the chats for so long, uh, and it's, it's been really interesting to, to learn with you and kind of see what's going on. So, yeah, it's been a bit of a, an interesting journey, to be honest, and um, probably due to my lack of enjoyment of education the first time around. <laughs> That's how I describe it. So um, when I went into to study it originally, I didn't particularly enjoy the whole kind of system that was going probably wasn't as motivated as it should have been. Um, and during my college, I started building. And then afterwards, I started to build as well as in the construction industry for um, maybe three or four years. At that point, then, like I learned quite a lot about physical accessibility. So we were renovating these old estate houses in the country here in Ireland. And we were looking at ways to, to turn them into accessible venues for people. So. Uh, for example, if you had a, a state house and you opened it up to the, the public, you would actually get some funding and some support by the government here to do that. So you would get some some help with that. So a lot of um, a lot of people who own these estate houses were quite interested in uh, making their areas accessible, so they could show people around the house and they could like um, have like you know bring bring people on tours. So part of what we were doing was literally physically building ramps up to these massive. 12 foot high doors and and helping people to get around and simple things like railings and whatever else it was there. So it was kind of very practical things. And and at that time, I'll be honest, I was doing it because I needed the money <laughs> and I wanted to, you know, you're, you're learning as you go along and you don't even see the, the kind of the, the end product for a while. And then suddenly you've got the house and it's opened up to the public and you see people going in on their wheelchairs and whatever else it might be. And you kind of realize, oh, wow, this is actually really impactful. But even at that, it didn't quite hit me, to be perfectly honest. So I went back um, almost five years ago now, and when I was 24, and I went back to college again. And what was kind of ironic was that I went in to study a master's in learning and teaching, um, which, having experienced it the first time around, was kind of a, a strange experience. But in saying that, it allowed me to reflect on, on why things had failed the first time. And then I had this very practical accessibility knowledge. And it was just. It was a little bit of luck, I think, in one sense, because when I was in university, I, I did my kind of practical teaching module, but um, due to the fact that I had no previous experience, the only place that would take me on was the National Learning Network, which is actually under the umbrella of the rehab group. And in those classrooms where I was teaching, there was young adults with uh, intellectual disabilities, learning disabilities, uh, who were uh, on the autistic uh, spectrum. and went into the classrooms at different levels, and most of them were probably 18 to 22 year olds. They were thereabouts, but some, were, some people were older within that. And started teaching pretty much everything I could get my hands on because I wanted to learn as much as possible about uh, being in the classroom. And so I was teaching IT, I was teaching communications, uh, independent living skills, uh, pretty, pretty much everything. Um, and because of the, the nature of the classrooms, it gave a lot of scope to try lots of new things. So I started following, I got on Twitter actually, that's my first step into Twitter. Went on, started following some different chats. Um, for example, the Irish educational chat was one, so hashtag Ed Chatty. Um, and then little by little, kind of got into the sense of it and then spotted yourselves at a, a certain point along that road as well, the, the access chat. Um, and I used the, these different chats to actually take the learnings from that, what other people were doing, see what was going on and try and bring them into the classroom. And initially that was in an educational setting. Um, but because I was working with people with different disabilities and different needs, the accessibility uh, part of that started to come to the fore again. And I started to see some kind of relations to what I was doing in a classroom, to what I had been doing when I was uh, building and, and actually building physical spaces. Um, and it was simple things at first that you notice in a classroom that you never really think of when you have a classroom full of people who, uh, I suppose, don't have any different needs uh, than, than, than maybe a lot of people would have. 
But then this one uh, young woman came into our classroom and she was a wheelchair user and she had an electric wheelchair. And the door that we had to the classroom um, wasn't quite um, wasn't quite big enough, I suppose, at that point. And as a, as a builder, I was kind of looking at that going, oh, you know, what can we start to, to do about our classroom that will start to make it more accessible? So we went through different processes trying to, to figure out, you know, what, how we can get some funding for that, how we can make that happen and things like that. And then on the, on the flip side of the physical, um, I also noticed that there is, well, I, like, I like technology. I'm not an IT person as such, but I like tech um, from like different gaming backgrounds and stuff like that. And I was kind of interested in learning technologies at that point too. And really curiously, like we started to look at virtual worlds. So for example, uh, Minecraft and the accessibility um, of a platform like that uh, and, and how a, a learning platform, an almost an informal learning platform like Minecraft can create learning experiences from a social interaction perspective as well, was, was really fascinating to me. Um, so what we did was, and I kind of tied everything together at this point, um, was we would go out in, uh, into the, uh, maybe the outskirts of Dublin, we would find an old estate house, <laughs> we would get the blueprints, we would step it out, we would measure it, we would get all the ideas and we'd bring it back to the, the virtual world. We'd build it up inside it, we'd make it accessible in the game, even if it was just for our avatars. Um, and we had people there who were on the, who were autistic and they started to talk to each other when they'd never done that before. So not only was is there an accessibility aspect to the stuff we were doing, but then there was also this really interesting learning experience um, where I suppose you would, I don't know what I would how I would describe it, but they were almost accessing um, social interaction, like where where they'd never been able to do that before. There was this bridge now that these online virtual worlds were allowing them to be able to, to feel comfortable talking. And um, I found out afterwards that there's this thing called the, the disembodied voice, and it's when people are using avatars, they feel more comfortable expressing themselves. Um, and kind of had I'd stumbled across that in the classroom, and I thought that was really fascinating. Then I kind of really got interested in that. And we have a, a Minecraft convention here. And I met a guy and he had founded uh, this thing called Autcraft, which was which was fascinating. And that was specifically for uh, the autistic community, uh, for parents and for kids. And they had specific rules that allowed people with autism to feel very comfortable in that space. So um, at that point, then, I'm sorry for going on for so long. So stop me at any point if you have any questions on this. Um, the, the company came to me, the rehab group, who were kind of over the National Learning Network. And they said to me, hey, you're doing some really interesting stuff. Um, would be really interesting to see how we could um, try some of this stuff on a, on a kind of a wider scale within the organization. And to give you a bit of a sense of the rehab group, we have maybe like almost maybe 17,000 people with different disabilities that we have within the organization and probably about a little bit over 3,000 staff. So it's quite big, the, lar the largest, um, Section 39 organization here in, in in Ireland and the largest non-government employer of people with disabilities as well, which is which is really fascinating. So I started working in all these different streams, the employability stream, so supporting people uh, with disabilities in employment, the learning stream, which is obviously my, my first passion and my first love with, with everything that I do. And uh, then also we have our community uh, care services as well for people with more severe disabilities uh, and our residential services too, where people live and of explore that and at that point um tried a few different things and tried to to look at how we can use technologies that are mainstream to to make environments accessible and that's when we when i bumped in we met lisa who was um one of our one of the people working within this uh, who, who comes along to our services and uh, gets support and we were trying to figure out needs that was our big thing it's like ask people what their, their needs are and we were we had lots of chats and lots of meetings and uh, we brought in amazon alexa which was really interesting and uh, it's like what 50 60 euro and um, tried out a few different kind of uh, interesting apps that we found that perhaps weren't uh, altogether um, mainstream at that point we, we would kind of put some stuff together and, and eventually then lisa was able to control her environment which was something i think that lots of people in the states are doing um, but here in Ireland, not a lot of people had been had been doing that, and um, so that got really big uh, interest at that point. So there, that's kind of 
Um, the long, the long story, but I don't think it's only a short story. There. <laughs> no. <laughs> so that's really interesting, and I, I, I know that um, you know there's a lot of work going on. We all see a lot of potential in voice assistants and and the ability to hook up various different things in the connected home to create environments that are more inclusive. Um, I know Deborah, you've got a question, so I'll 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 hand over to you. Well, thank you, and you know, David, I, I know it was a long story, but I think it was fascinating. Yeah, as you explained the journey, and it also, as you were explaining it, I, I was thinking about some dynamics that I, I'm not sure if I thought of in this specific way until I heard your story, but. There's multiple things that fascinate me about your story. In the first place, I'm much older than everybody on the call, and <laughs> and I have a very important birthday this year. But when I was a young woman, you know, we didn't have all this stuff, and I mean, a lot of the stuff has taken place as as I've been alive. And so, I think it's so interesting how young people now are finding their path and they're finding their their passions and where they want to make a difference in the world but how they're connecting the dots i think it's fascinating how to listen how you connect the dots and how you brought it into the classrooms and i i'm always interested in how teachers are using all this technologies to pull this all together and and, and we're it's fascinating to me because we're using these technologies to explore our worlds to engage with each other, to learn from each other, to teach each other in ways that I, I, it's, I don't even know where it's going to go. It's hard for me to even try to predict just listening to your journey. And so I, I would say, and I'm not going to do it on the show, but I, I could tell you my winding journey of how I got into this field. You know, an easy an easy one would be when I was 28 years old, I gave birth to a daughter who, you know, was diagnosed four months later with Down syndrome. So certainly that was a, a very important point. But I just think it's very interesting now how creative young people like you use all these experience, tie all the social media, all the ways that we're having conversations to really change the world. Because the first I knew about you, I know that we were talking before we went on air about there's some very interesting things happening in Ireland. And I I don't know if it's I'm paying attention because of Antonio and I just think Antonio's such a genius. And I I don't I sometimes you're not sure why it's in your universe, but I, I really like that how all these technologies can be used to break down the barriers so that people like you can really be successful and you can help others be successful. So I I just wonder you know, where do we go next with all this, uh, the, the beauty of this technology? So, Deborah, I, I think it's, it's important that we are talking about using uh, the knowledge from social networks for learning and development. Okay? And so sometimes we have so much noise, even though, know, uh, especially, especially sometimes even from marketeers, you know, that, that they look at this as platform just for marketing and advertising. but. Social networks are one of the most important platforms for learning and development, to discover other people, to connect us more. And I think people need to focus more on that side of social networks than on the on the on than on anything else. And I think if people do that, I, I think they will find more value and they will find more interesting things in order to improve their lives, in order to explore knowledge and, and to meet people that otherwise we would never meet. Like, you know, where I met Dave, it, first of all, online first, and we are both in Ireland, and now you met Dave through, you know, through each other. So I think it's particularly interesting to see what he has done. It's fascinating, actually, and, and, and yeah, I, I, I think a lot of credit has to go to, to the likes of Access Chat. Because for me, what what it's doing is there's actually an accessibility issue with that. Is that you're you're allowing people access to a domain, um, and that allows the kind of creativity to 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 start to happen. And and often I think people just don't see how they can access it, and and they don't see that 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 bridge. And and because of that, it's probably like you said, Deborah, 
Ireland's on your radar now, but probably accessibility hasn't been on a lot of people's radar without the support of the technology, the social media as well, especially, and the promotion of that. And and now with the with the amplification of the message that Access Chat allows and Hack Access Dublin that we're running as well, and all the different little things that people are doing, there is now that access to the domain and it allows people to start to enter it and start to be creative with it and start to try things and fail and mess around and you know that's fine too but out of that there's this evolutionary kind of process that something sticks and then someone builds on that and then something builds on that and hopefully and like I, i've seen a positivity to it anyway for sure yeah and you know what's also interesting about it I, you know we access chat has been such a labor of love for all of us and we we work really hard with access chat we're volunteers you know we are blessed that barclays supports us um, with, you know, but most of the work that we do, we, we all volunteer doing it. And it's, it's been interesting as voices have come in and out of our community over the years, because there have actually been people that are on access chat that sometimes they get mad at us. We had somebody that say, said the other day, um, well, you didn't do this and we wanted you to do that. So I'm not joining anymore. And I was like, so you're going to let that little thing stop your voice from being heard? Just curious what you're saying to me here. And it is it is interesting because, you know, we can do whatever we want with these um, opportunities. And you're a wonderful example, David, of how you used the good of these tools to not only improve your life, but to improve the life of your students and now your clients. And so it, you we have so much open open to us now, but it is still, how do you choose to use this? How do you choose to engage with the conversations that that matters? And I think that is something that we are very proud of at Access Chat because we try to listen to what people are um, saying, even though sometimes they don't, they just want to complain as opposed to really, um, you know, wanting to have a solution. So it's very interesting listening to your story. And uh, let me hand the mic off to, um, I don't know, David, I'll hand it back to you and then, you know, but because but, I don't want to monopolize it, but I, I think it's just very interesting, your journey. In terms of the, the attitude is a key aspect to it, and I'm sure that Neil and Antonio would agree on this, because I think the narrative that you've, allowed, you've brought out of the, the chats and the different things that you're putting out and through the different media uh, streams has been uh, very positive. Like there's a, a realism to it. So obviously like you're you're being realistic in terms of what's uh, achievable at certain points, but there is a, this idea of hope and that, you know, by connecting enough people together that you can do something very purposeful, very practical, very impactful for people. And I think that's what we are hoping to try and do both within the rehab group from my own personal perspective and um, within our different communities. Like I have a few, quite a few, Kind of hats that I put on with Learning Tech Labs, which is kind of learning technology focus, uh, Hack Access Dublin, which is again that we do with Janice, who you had on before, who's amazing. And then uh, we've got our startup week that's coming up, which has a specific diversity inclusion stream that will focus on all of this kind of things from all different angles and including disabilities. And uh, then we've got a, a ton of <laughs> other things that are just, and it's all about trying to connect the dots, like you're saying. and. For me, I don't like having things just like blocked off into sections because that's not how society works. It's not how things like change happens. It's when you start to overlap these together, find those like points that are similar, that you can start conversations like with people who are entirely different to, in their way of thinking and, and everything to you. But if you can find that little part in the middle, that it's, it's amazing what people will do and what people can do for you and for the, their communities. So really what we focus on is Obviously, online environments, physical environments are very important, but as important as that, and probably more so, are the communities that we build up within that. Because if we don't have those, then pretty much we all don't have, or we, don't, we have nothing, literally, because um, every, everything idea that we have and everything that we put forward will just hit that brick wall. And unfortunately, you do meet people who try to, you know, maybe have, maybe they have agendas, or maybe they have like just experiences that has, have, have put stuff in front of them, but hopefully, we can kind of like work with them, bring them back around and, and, and push them forward as a bit as well, because look, we're all at different stages. 
and I guess we're in very positive parts of our, our, our process within this and, and the accessibility process, but maybe some people have, have experienced things in different ways. And, and I, I think that there's no better people than yourselves and from the different communities that we have here. Uh, like the like, so even in Scotland there with, with Gavin Meade, um and, and those, uh, there's a lot of positive things happening and hopefully they'll show the way so that somebody will come back maybe even a year later and go, well, actually, maybe there's a, maybe that's an option, you know? So yeah, no, there's a, a positivity, which I like about this as well, which is, which is kind of cool. I, I think that's the, the, the key point. We designed Access Chat to be positive. Um, our view was there's a lot of stuff that's out there that's negative. You know, we, we know we live in an imperfect world. Uh, we know there's loads of stuff that still has to be done and that um, there are still barriers in the way. But let's focus on what we can do. Let's focus on bringing people together. Let's focus on um, the good things that people are already doing and bring those people together as part of a community. Um, and that's what's been gratifying because we have built a community and you mentioned people like Gavin who are also positively minded and, and really upbeat about what's going on. People like Janet also. So I, I think that that relentless positivity does win out in the end. And we've seen people that have left have come back over time and, 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 and we will welcome people with open arms because that's the point of the community is it's meant to be inclusive and embracing. So, um, yeah, I, I'm glad you've noticed. I'm glad you've mentioned some of our favorite people too, um, because we, we, we do love them and, and our community, the access chat community wouldn't be what it is without the people that take part. You know, Deborah and Antonio and I are the sort of the constant, but so is the community. So, um, you know, uh, also, I mean, someone else that has been part of this community and, and a former guest who does amazing work is Nabil Eid over in Syria. And he makes a huge effort in a, in a, in a time um, you know, that has been very, very difficult in Syria. Um, and he's still contributing to, to global accessibility. He's contributing to the uh, accessibility for refugees. You know, it's amazing, amazing work that Nabil is doing. So. Um, yeah, and, and despite that, he's still coming and taking the time to contribute to making other people's lives better and, and being part of the community. So, yeah. It's a little, I mean, little, little yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, I'm there moaning, oh, God, I haven't done my questions yet. You know, it's like, and he's there and it's like 43 different questions, essay length, you know. <laughs> on the, on the world, world. Uh, organization, Peace Index, I think Surya is at the very bottom of it. Like, so it goes to show you, you know. It's just a, a incredible stuff, but it's really interesting in terms of community. Like we were asked to, um, myself and my colleague flew out to, to Saudi for the the International Rehabilitation Disability Conference over there. Um, and what was really interesting, I ran a workshop there and on the abilities of, of people with disabilities in Saudi society. And it was all under, under uh, King Solomon's kind of uh, research department. And we had a lot of people there and a lot of, of women who fed into that uh, process. And what we tried to come up with campaigns um, to try and create this positivity. And one of the interesting things that came out of it was most of the people actually wanted to create clubs or like communities around sports or whatever else it might be for people with disabilities to start to get involved. And, and yeah, I just, I just think thought it was fascinating because the, I think we all, as humans end up being drawn back to that idea of trying to do things together and have that community. And look, Nabil has just done amazing stuff. Like we're just even watching him like tweet along the stuff. That's that's my only kind of real um connection with him. But like he stands out. I think um there's just a few people like that who just yeah, they're they're really incredible and, and kind of inspiring in in a, in an age where like a lot of people are doing a lot of stuff. They kind of just are at that top point of like going, okay, that's that's awesome. It's an interesting one, but Deborah and I have also been out in Saudi, and we know they're doing good work, you know. And there's a huge will to change um, not only society in general with Saudi Arabia's sort of vision 2030, but but also uh, 
the vision to be a much more inclusive society for people with disabilities. And I know that the, the people like Engineer Sohail is, is uh, they're really driving the, 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 the work forwards. Now, it's not that they don't have a difficult task because they do. But but there's definitely a, a, a will to do things differently there. Um, someone else I really uh, admire, who was an Access Chat guest before, um, is is, um, is Nerdin is Tuncha, who is the lawyer in Turkey who set up the Turkish Guide Dogs Association. You know, what she's doing is is really amazing because she's going against the flow as well. Because society in Turkey, quite often, Muslim society is not a dog owning society. So, um, so, um, but she's introduced guide dogs in, and she has done an amazing job on generating publicity and goodwill, um, and is is like a one woman publicity machine. Um, so, so although she doesn't necessarily join Access Chat that much, we're in regular contact with Nuinanis because she's she's still, you know putting the good work out there. And I love people that are, are, are that passionate that are, that are going out and you know giving their lives to this stuff. So I guess um, if we sort of go around the circle a bit, we, you know, we're, we're, we're all going to be together in Dublin in, in a little while to, um, to do Hack Access Dublin. What would you like to see as an outcome for this next hack access, I know there are there are particular themes, but what is the outcome you would like to see from it? That's an easy question. <laughs> yeah, I can see Antonio just waiting here just to, to hear what I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I am prepared. I'm prepared. I've got my hack access hashtag hack access job T-shirt on, <laughs> so I'll make sure that every one of you have have one of those. Um, so. This year has kind of it's been it's been great. So myself and, and, and Janice have, have worked um, quite a bit to try and build up our partnerships around the different areas, and we're we're really excited the fact that uh, Dublin City Council have have come on board to support us this year. That was a big step. So they actually have they've offered us a, um, a space in the city, like one of the streets, and there are new smart docklands that we can maybe test some of the stuff out that comes out of it if it's appropriate to, to do so. We're, so we're really hoping that, that someone creates something really impactful that we can go, okay, here, let's try this out because we just had our first um, trialing, not not maybe personally, but the innovation docklands uh, of the uh, this aut autonomous bus that's going up and down the, the docklands at the moment. Um, so there's there's plenty of desire to do something really innovative and new and cool and, and impactful. But for me, um, there's a couple of things. So, so first of all is to, develop our community because it is quite new and um, it's only a couple of years since the very first hack access so the community is one of the biggest parts of that uh, we have seen a big improvement so we have more people coming to our kind of quarterly events and, and really getting involved in some of the different ideation workshops that we're doing myself and uh, Colin Kyo and a few others with, with Janice and that's one and then the next thing is that we create sustainable solutions so that sustainability for me is the, the biggest challenge and um, probably for all of us working in this area because I suppose trying to get money and funding and stuff like that behind it is is, is one thing but then how do you support people who have full-time jobs who are coming along to to create solutions to be able to continue those projects or maybe even find streams where maybe they don't continue it if they can't but that there's a handoff to other organizations who see the purpose and um, so there's that in itself, I think, to me, is the biggest thing because look, hackathons have been going on forever. We've all been doing hackathons. We've all been involved in trying to create solutions. And people have great ideas. There's a huge buzz, and it's my favorite event of the year. But I want to see the, that sustainability. So when uh, we're a year from now, we're, we're all kind of, you know, talking about what, what went on and how great it was to meet. Um, I'd love to be able to to go, hey, and it's brilliant that this is out there and this is out there and this is still going on and we're actually building on that. So yeah, there's a, there's a good bit, of, there's a good chunk in that, uh, but that I, I would for me, and I suppose that's why we're, we're asking you to get involved because you're experts in, in these areas and, and it's to get um, support in terms of um, mentorship and um, ideas and also understanding the business element of these 
accessibility solutions is a huge aspect to it because you've got these amazing accessible uh, accessibility uh, leaders, people who are working as instructors, as, as carers, people who have disabilities themselves, and that's a big part of it too. Um, but to be able to provide that knowledge, how to actually work in, in the ecosystem too is really important. And then finally, going back to it, we want people with disabilities to, to come along, to share their knowledge, and to actually create solutions to their own challenges themselves. And I think there's a huge part of that that we're trying to push this year. Um, because I, I work in, in kind of the startup world, I work in the education world, things like that. But um, for me, if we can have some people who have a disability, who are who are in, empowered to be entrepreneurs, or they get an idea to go, oh, maybe I can actually create my, even my own startup out of this, that would be a, a massive success because then that story will be told and will inspire other people to get involved. And sometimes it's going back to that bridge and of providing access to that domain. How, Access Dublin should be that bridge uh, and having you on board, having your support is not only, first of all, really energizing from my perspective, but I think for the people who are in Dublin who are going to become along for them and it will bring people in, it'll, it'll uh, allow people to go, oh, come along, you know, maybe I'll find something out new and, and get involved. So there's three things, three things, community, Excellent. Uh, get people involved and uh, no, that, that's fabulous. I, I agree uh, on the sustainability issue. I think it's really important, um, and, and that's something Microsoft have been pushing about their their hackathons and, and the development of products out of them. So they've they've even written a book around it. So um, it wouldn't be uh, fair for us to um, wrap up without thanking you know, the people that help us turn this out every week. That's Barclays and MyClearText. We value your support greatly. So, and thank you, David. It's been a pleasure chatting with you. We're really looking forward to actually meeting up with you in the flesh. I have been told that I need to grow a beard, um, something a bit more than the chin strap, if, if I'm to represent properly. So, um, looking forward to seeing you and being a little bit more here, sweet. Thank you very much, David. Absolute pleasure. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you.